Early African Civilizations, Ghana and Mali, Social Science, Section 3. West African Empires. Nilotic Egypt had the river as its lifeline and adjacent fertile land, which was replenished annually by floods. But west of the Nile River, northern Africa has no major rivers, and rainfall is sparse except along the southern coast. As a result, when large states formed in West Africa, they were based on the control of revenue from long-distance trade. The rise of ancient Ghana, the first of the Savannah empires, did not begin until several centuries after the age of Pharaonic Egypt had ended. West Africans did not have a written language that was comparable to Egyptian hieroglyphs. Thus, our knowledge of ancient Ghana from before 900 CE is based on archaeology, linguistics, and indirect evidence. From 900 to 1300 CE, Arabic written sources and the earliest oral traditions increased our understanding of ancient Ghana. After 1300, accounts from Portuguese and other European traders sailing along the coasts of the Gulf of Guinea and from visitors like Ibn Battuta, who went to Mali in 1352 to 1353, and Leo Africanus, who visited Songhai several times, provide written records of the African societies they encountered. After 1600, oral traditions that are more detailed and some written records compiled by Africans assist historians. Written sources, however, are spotty. The written record of some areas of West Africa from 1000 to 1500 has significant gaps. Clearly, there is much we do not know. West Africans and North Africans created a network of trade routes on either side of the Sahara, but there were only a few ways to travel across the desert. Usually, Berbers act as a, acted as intermediaries between the two groups. The exchange of gold for salt was one of the most important transactions. Sources of West African gold came from three separate fields, but no West African empire was ever able to control all three. Bambuk, between the Senegal and Foleme rivers, Bure, near the upper Niger River, and Akan, in the forest and savanna of present-day Ghana, which led Europeans to call the adjacent coastline the Gold Coast. It must be noted, however, that the eastern region of West Africa had a trade route north from Kanem Bornu to Tripoli that involved no significant amount of gold. Instead, caravan merchants traded in slaves, salt, and weapons. The West African commercial empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai strove to control the trans-Saharan trade, which took place at transshipment points located in the desert fringe areas of the Sahel. By providing a safe place for traders from different regions to find each other, rulers could charge taxes and traders could make shorter, more numerous trading trips, thus increasing profits. The danger of commercial travel in the desert was left to the Tamahawk-speaking desert dwellers called Tuareg, who transported goods throughout the Sahara. Each West African empire provided a vital extension to the commercial trade of North Africa, and much West African gold ended up as currency in Europe. Ghana. Ghana, the first West African commercial empire, was bounded by the Senegal River Valley, the upper Niger River Valley, and the Sahara Desert in what is today Mali and southern Mauritania, about a thousand miles northwest of the present-day country of Ghana. Ghana's terrain in the Sahel was predominantly grassland, and its major transshipment point was Kumbi Saleh. Many of its inhabitants were Iron Age farmers under the rule of a local chief. The major ethnic group and rulers of the Ghana were the Soninke. Over time, local rulers were integrated into a more centralized administration that ultimately evolved into Imperial Ghana. A major catalyst for Ghana's growth was the gold that was mined from one of the richest goldfields in Africa, Bambuk. Soninke merchants bought gold from the Wangara of Bambuk, who live in present-day Senegal and the Gambia, and often transported it via the Tuareg from transshipment points like Odugast, Timbuktu, and Gao, north toward another transshipment point in contemporary Morocco. And from there, goods were distributed across North Africa as far as the Mediterranean coast. In the desert between Siji Lilma Massa and Ghana was Taghaza, the location of great quantities of salt deposited during the evaporation of an ancient Saharan Sea. As astonishing as it may sound today, the people of ancient Ghana occasionally traded gold for salt in equal weight. 
If we put this into perspective, however, consider the necessity of salt in one's diet and its food preservation value. After acquiring it from Ghana, North Africans traded gold throughout the Mediterranean world. Other Ghanaian exports included ivory, ostrich feathers, hides, leather, and slaves. In return, traders in Ghana took a variety of goods, especially weapons, textiles, horses, and salt. In 1042 CE, Muslim Sahaja Berbers, known as the Almoravids, who over the centuries had traded with Ghana, became Ghana's enemies and took control of the transshipment points. For a time, they ruled Ghana as a province of an empire that reached into central Spain, but Ghana recovered some of its independence within 50 years. Ghana fell for the last time in 1203 CE to the Soso from farther south. One of West Africa's greatest dynasties, that of ancient Mali, would soon fill this vacuum in power. Mali. With the Saharan trade in chaos, it was natural that someone would seek to restore order and take control. The next Sahel Empire was founded by Malinke herders from the area between the Senegal and Niger rivers. More is known about the Mali Empire than ancient Ghana, in part because of the story of its founder, Sundiata Keita, is still told to this day in West Africa and has been published in numerous translations. Sundiata Keita. Both Sundiata Keita and his epic are exceptional in West African history. Sundiata is credited in oral tradition with founding Mali, the West African Malinke Empire that succeeded ancient Ghana, although some of its earliest origins date back to about 900 CE under the Keitas, who were the ancestors of Sundiata. Mali, or Malel, as found in Arabic literature by the 800 CE, means where the king resides. Sundiata defeated the conquerors of Ghana, the Soso, at the Battle of Krina in 1235 and ruled Mali from 1235 to 1255. The Epic of Sundiata Griots, who inherit their vocations as oral historians and who give performances, often accompanied by drums and choras, have theatrically conveyed Sundiata's life and accomplishments for some 800 years. There are several versions of the Sundiata epic, including an entertaining and educational film, Keita, The Heritage of Griot, although the film only considers Sundiata's life until his exile in his 20s. Themes in the epic and film include the importance of lineage, destiny, prophecy, Islam, traditional African religion, perseverance, right action, and the tension between tradition and modernity. From the Gambian and Senegalese river estuaries to the famous trading cities of Timbuktu and Gao on the Niger River, the Mande speakers of Mali built their power on gold extracted from Bambuk and a new gold field at Bure, which produced perhaps two thirds of the world's production at the time. Working with the peoples in the Soninke, Kasonke, and Futanke language groups, ancient Mali traded gold across the Sahara to Sijilzma, Masa, and Taghasa. Ancient Mali was located further south than the more arid Ghana. Mali's farmers grew sorghum, a grass plant that looks somewhat like corn and from which molasses is derived, millet, another grass plant from which cereal is made, and rice. From the southern center of power, some distance from the fringes of the Sahara, the Mande speakers of Mali spread Islam further than their North African Muslim trader predecessors. Those who led this process were the successors of Sundiata, the Mansas of the Keita clan. Mansa Musa and Mansa Kao. The most famous ruler of Mali after Sundiata was Mansa Musa, who is noted for his Hajj, pilgrimage to Mecca, in 1324 CE. According to Egyptian sources, Mansa Musa's Hajj caravan of 60,000 porters included 500 servants dressed in gold and with staffs of gold, and he spent so much gold that the precious metals market price fell and did not recover for over 12 years. As historian Ross Dunn stated, in the history of medieval West Africa, no single incident has been more celebrated. Indeed, the Hajj of Mansa Musa sums up Mali's important place among the kingdoms of Africa and Asia in Im Batuta's time. More significant than tales of gold, Mansa Musa promoted Islam. He financed the construction of many mosques, including the great mosques of Gao and Timbuktu, the transcription of Qurans, and the Islamic scholarship by surrounding himself with Muslim teachers. Some of these scholars were foreigners who had followed him back to Mali. Timbuktu became a major center of Islamic scholarship in West Africa. Mansa Musa was well remembered for his wealth, generosity, and good manners. 
Indeed, Arabic scholars give more recognition to Mansa Musa than to Sundiata, the founder of Mali, because Musa did so much more to promote Islam in Mali. Mansa Musa's predecessor, Mansa Kao, also deserves mention because there are sources which suggest that he may have financed a fleet of some 2,000 ships that sailed west to explore the Atlantic Ocean. They never returned, but Mali's greatness has encouraged scholars to seek its connection with other epic historical events, including the crossing of, Atlantic, of the Atlantic Ocean by ship. Some scholars speculate that Mende-speaking West Africans from Mali made it to the New World about 200 years before Columbus. Ibn Battuta and Mali. Ibn Battuta, who some consider the Marco Polo of Islam, visited Mali after traveling through and working in the Muslim world between Morocco and perhaps China, and certainly India from 1325 to 1351. Ibn Battuta visited Mali from February 1352 to December 1353, about 15 years after Mansa Musa died. Ibn Battuta headed south from Tangier to Sijilmasa and joined a caravan heading to Timbuktu. Along the way, Ibn Battuta described the trade based on dromedaries, single humped camels, which were used to carry loads in the desert as early as the 100 CE. A typical caravan would begin before dawn and travel until it became too hot, at which time the camel would be unloaded and awnings stretched over the animals and men to protect them from the harsh sun. As the sun receded, the caravan was set out again and continued until nightfall, whereupon they would set up camp. Whatever route traders took across the desert, danger was never far. Even the veteran travel Ibn Battuta fell seriously ill for several months in Mali. Ibn Battuta also commented on Tuareg he met as good for nothing, perhaps because they did not practice Islam according to his standards. On the eve of the voyage of Christopher Columbus to the New World and Europe's Christian Reformation, the heyday of Mali was coming to an end. But the next great West African empire, Songhai, was on the rise. 